viewers on SLC Adventist and good afternoon to those who are listening via uh, Second Advent Radio and welcome to Let's Talk. We are delighted to be with you this afternoon again for our continuation of surviving and thriving after a divorce. Today we share part two and um, you may be happy to know that we are going to be taking an extra half hour today. Um, the last time you, you realize that our time was limited. So we have arranged, especially for uh, this topic for this week, to take an extra half hour. So we will be going until 4.30. We trust that you are doing well, that God has been blessing you. We would like to invite you to have a word of prayer with us at this time. Eternal Father and our God, we thank you for the opportunity to minister to our friends who are listening via the internet, um, whether it be on Facebook, on YouTube, or whether they are listening via a Second Advent Radio. We pray that you will be with us as we seek to um, clarify issues and to make clear the challenges of divorce and how folks can overcome and uh, be able to rebound. We ask that you will guide the process in your precious name. Amen. So this afternoon, uh, our friends, we are back with part two. Um, we did make some adjustments so that we could bring you part two of this subject quickly. And with us again, we have our Pastor Stanton Adams. Pastor Adams is going to be uh, sharing uh, with us on, on, on coping mechanisms and how we can um, minister in, in an effective way to those who are affected by divorce. Pastor Adams, good afternoon. Pleasant good afternoon. Again, to all those who are on the platform viewing and those who are listening via Advent Radio, it is my delight to be here for part two of this very important discourse conversation. And I did see some of the comments indeed in the chat and so on. And, uh, it seemed as though this was a long awaited conversation. Kudos to you, Dr. Green, for dealing with this one, particularly this time. <laughs> very well. We also have with us back again is a Sister Cora Galloway. Sister Galloway is a practicing attorney on the island of Montserrat. We are delighted to have you, Sister Galloway. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Green. It is good to be here. Um, if I may, one thing I would like to say, the last time I received feedback, mixed feedback of some person's surprised and upset of how open I was, you know, some were saying I put all my business out there. But the reason that I am doing it, it is not to paint a picture of my ex-husband as a bad person, but as a ministry that if what I went through could help somebody. So it is not to um, if you like paint him as a bad guy, there's, there's none of that at all, but just to help persons because sometimes there are questions that if perhaps I had received answers or been told that some things that I could have avoided. So I just wanted to let them know that's why I am here on this program to help somebody. And, and thanks so much for that comment. Um, we really are not in the business of, of painting any negative picture at all. We have here individuals who are willing to share their own experience, their journey, what they have been through. And um, the idea, as Sister Galloway rightly said, is to be able to provide assistance for people who may be confronted with the same issues. We also have with us Sister Barbara Bell. Sister Bell, good afternoon and welcome. Sister Bell is now a retired civil servant. Happy to have you back, Sister Bell. Good afternoon, Dr. Green. Good afternoon to the other members of the panel. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope this afternoon will be meaningful, full of information and we just pray for each other because remember after life, have last. Okay, and finally we have Brother Adrian Bass. 
Good afternoon, um, Elder Bass. Elder Bass is, uh, um, do I describe it as a, a, a broker, a, a loans, um, loans, loans officer at yeah. the Antigua Commercial Bank? We're happy to have you, Elder Bass. Happy to be here, Dr. Green, and um, well, happy to be a part of part two of this important topic, and we hope that we will have meaningful discussions this afternoon, and good afternoon to all our listening and viewing audience. Okay, wonderful. Now, when we left off last time, we were, we were responding to the question with regard to what was your most difficult thing during this period of divorce, and all of you did respond to that in a meaningful way. Pastor Adams, let me begin with you this afternoon. You have seen um, some of the, the, the responses in the chat, some of the um, comments that people have been making, and um, I think generally they are individuals who are very appreciative of the information we're able to share. There are, of course, many, many persons out there who are divorced, who um, have struggled silently by themselves because of of people not understanding their situation and um, mm-hmm. and, and and with with not feeling safe to talk, they simply, um, you know, just just so to speak, suffer in silence. So yeah. so this afternoon, Pastor Adams, I, I want to begin. Um, with you, just simply by asking you um, to give some general comments on the whole matter of how the, the loneliness that the divorced person suffers and, and, and what now can be done. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I just want to repeat because I don't know if um, the audience is the same or if somebody else some other people have joined us most likely, but I just want to say that the divorce or separation can trigger all sorts of unsettling and uncomfortable and frightening feelings and thoughts and emotions that includes the loneliness that you just mentioned in, and, and grief, right? Yes, um, the same stages that we go through when somebody dies. In fact, in my experience, I think that um, I did better dealing with um, people who have lost loved ones and we buried them in the grave than dealing actually with people who have suffered the death of a relationship. Um, The pain is different. Uh, The pain is different. Uh, And um, I have seen that uh, real time. (laughs) In fact, I prefer to deal with death and dying than deal with the um, dying and death (laughs) of a, a marriage or relationship cause of what is involved there. So it's not only loneliness, but there's this depression, there could be despair, guilt, um, frustration, um, anxiety, anger, um, there's um, devastation, a sense of rejection, not only rejection by your friends and your church and whoever else, family, but there could also be the serious issue of self-rejection you are questioning your own value or worth. What did you do wrong? Are you really um, are you really capable? And based on the feedback that people give, um, you might end up rejecting your own self. But I think if time allow, I'll talk to how to deal with that own your own personal um, self rejection. What what you can do. So all of that, and I think one of the panelists did mention um, the sense of um, embarrassment. Um, some people feel that way. Um, when you have to change your status and you have to um, fill up a form and instead of writing married, you don't have to write divorced, you know, um, all of these are challenges. Um, there's intense sadness at, at, the, at the thought that the end, this is now the end of a deeply, a deeply sig- significant relationship. This is not just something that, oh, particularly if you've been married for some time and you've made investment, yeah, emotional, financial investment, investment in children and and several things, right? And then all of these goals, um, this could really bring some intense sadness and grief, you know, that the end of a deeply significant um, um, relationship um, is there. Then there's the fear, um, the fear, um, you know, of, of, of the prospect of being single alone, um, being a, just single and alone, not just for a moment, but for probably a long time, um, you know, 
uh, whether you will remain single forever. Um, and then you have to cope with the changes that comes along with that, um, you know, financial, living a social, um, your social living circumstances, then, um, you know, guilt over perceived failures that um, the relationship did not work out in spite of what you did and all that you did, right? So what I'm saying is that this, this kind of thing can have someone wake up 3 a.m. in the morning um, weeping and, and deep emotions when they're not really going to the airport to catch a plane. I'm just telling you that it can be so painful that people um, spend sleepless nights over this thing. And I could risk to tell you because um, he's a clinician, my brother-in-law, I have had divorce around me. My brother was separated. My brother-in-law was separated, um, who is a pastor and um, I remember that I was at college when um, that experience took place and um, he was passing through going to Puerto Rico um, he was working on his master's um, degree he and my cousin and um, I sat there and saw this man um, in real deep emotions and I was sitting there actually helpless because there was nothing I could have said or done I didn't have this skill or this knowledge at that time and um, he being a pastor said to me, uh, look, I opened the Bible um, and I can't even understand what is there. This is a trained minister who's an excellent preacher says that when he's been through this divorce and separation because of what occasioned it, um, he opens the Bible and didn't understand, couldn't, it was just blank. <laughs> so I am just saying that these things are real and um, oh, the church needs to understand um, and there's not a straight line in terms of recovery, right? Um, just as how people heal differently, um, the same thing happens when some people, when people separate. Everybody don't heal the same way. So don't force people and tell them, get it over. Um, um, let give people the time. And um, we have to work with and understand um, this, this experience that it can be so devastating. I think certainly, I mean, Pastor. Very, I'll very devastating. <laughs> certainly very devastating indeed. And you have, you have raised a number of areas there that I trust we will be able to 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 speak to eventually. Um, but I, I want to highlight one one element. Now the, the 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 pain and the agony of divorce may not be the same for either spouse, but both of them are affected one way or the other. Not so? Yes. Um, the, by gender uh, the research is not even conclusive and depending on um, who is doing the research and what they want to say. But I think that um, from my class notes and talking to other professionals in this field and so who have done research and have read quite a lot of the literature, um, both genders are affected. Um, the family, the children, children are affected and that's a different presentation by itself. But both genders are affected. But it seems as though the recovery in terms of getting back the emotions and those things together, um, women do better than men. And so the epidemiology of this research, of this study says that men have real problems, men have real ill health, men are more suicidal, in fact, commit suicide and um, suffer ill health and several things um, more than women. But, um, you know, the effects are the same. And I guess some more, if they do some more longitudinal research in this area, we might see um, the real effects um, when people are uh, male versus female based on, on, on the research. But as for now, uh, both genders are affected in serious ways. And if we think that men don't really suffer the emotions, men also suffer the emotions um, just like women, intense emotions just like women. There is this misnomer that, that, that men are tough and men are strong and men can ride through any storm but it's interesting that you're mentioning that, that women tend to do better than men. Um, and I think particularly when, when the, the man um, is in the situation where his wife walks out on him, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it really does impact significantly in that way. But I, now we, we, we want to get to the individuals to, to continue to share the experiences. But before we do so, Pastor Adams, Let's speak a little to the matter of, of the, the, the guilt. Now, last week, I think I mentioned um, the, the aspect of, of the, the dumper and the dumpy, the person who ends the relationship versus the person mm -hmm. who, who was dismissed from the relationship, so to speak. Yeah. 
Now, we, 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 we did indicate that one person feels rejected, the yes. other person feels guilt. Let's talk a little bit about the guilt aspect. So mm -hmm. when, when a man or a woman cheats on his or her spouse, and, and, and it ends in a divorce. There is the, the, the other person feels rejected, but then there is also the aspect of the, the guilt and people don't tend to focus on this a lot. So if you can say a word on that, you know, the, the, the person who did wrong and, and clearly and, and, and resulted and, and initiated the breakdown of this marriage, so to speak, um, what kind of guilt experiences do they go through? Yes, um, that is quite an experience. Uh, that, that guilt is quite an experience. And then um, we do not make it easier anyway. And um, <laughs> I, 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 when I looked at the questions that were posted um, there, I, I, I thought about that a bit because it's not just the hurt now, but the hurt plus the guilt. And um, we are very legalistic as a community, as a body. <laughs> And, uh, um, you know, but you, we still need to understand that um, whoever uh, was the guilty one, um, be it the man or the woman, whoever the guilty one, right, because we have to balance it. Not only men sometimes are guilty of extramarital affairs that women uh, sometimes do, are involved. Um, the, the, the fact is that even though this is happening and sometimes it's even becoming so commonplace today, um, I think that we can stop being so legalistic and be a little bit more um, um, loving if I think can we strike a balance between grace and law. I, I am not any here, anyway here condoning um, um, this behavior, but I think um, while the church must uphold law, I think, gosh, we can be a little bit more kind and sympathetic. And I think I want my church to understand that part. And um, um, the, the person who is guilty uh, must know that um, there's a record, but God, God forgives us. God forgives us and that, that grace is still sufficient. And in fact, that's one of the function of the ministry, uh, particularly family ministries. How do we restore people and how do we extend um, grace when there is brokenness and pain, um, depending on notwithstanding whatever has caused it, uh, you know, um, I would say um, for that person that you need to know that your relationship with God can be restored. Um, not, um, and, and, and when God forgives us, he forgives us. <laughs> um, right. That has to do with um, how genuine we are with our repentance and how much remorse. In fact, when we are genuine with our repentance and we are remorseful, um, people are more open to extending the olive branch in terms of forgiveness, even the person who you have wronged and, and, and you know, um, cheated on. Right. Um, it is the remorseful feeling and, and, and taking responsibility for action that helps us to deal with that grief and not to try to justify um, any behavior whatsoever, just to, just to pour it out there, guilty as charged, you know. And um, when God, God is so gracious um, to forgive us. And if God will do that, then we as a community of believers um, must also, I think, should act in some little bit more gracious ways um, to people who have erred in this way. Most certainly, very sobering thoughts, but I do want to bring in the, the rest of the, the group here. So um, as we think about those things and as our listeners uh, ponder, um, I trust that going forward, you will be able to relate differently to individuals who, who have been through this particular challenge. Now, I, I want to ask our the rest of the panelists, those of you who have been through this journey. Um, now, if you don't mind, um, who, who divorced you? Um, don't know who wants you. That's, that's a very simple kind of straightforward question. So let me begin with, with you, um, Elder Bass. Or who, who divorced you? Um, well, the application was filed by the other party. Okay, all right. Yeah. And oh. Sister Galloway? I, I filed the application. All right. And <laughs> Sister Bell? The application was filed against me. Okay. Now, interesting. So we have a mix. We have an interesting mix, both sides. Um, here is my next question to you. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a few questions um, that folks are asking, but let's first, let's first ask this. 
Have you been able to relate to your former spouse? And if so, was it a challenge getting there? I don't know who wants to begin um, this, this answer. Um, are you able to relate? And if so, was it a challenge? I will start faster. Okay. That, that, that indeed is a, is, is a challenge. But um, in praying, God reveals what it is that he would like you to do. And um, relating to what God is saying to you, you have to, as we say, swallow your pride and reach out. Um, but it has been a challenge. And there are two main things that caused me to reach out. And one of them is my sons were having exams and I was there praying and I was praying, I was praying away. And then at the end of the prayer, I was repeating the Lord's prayer. When I reached to the point that says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. It's like if uh, a light shone in me and say, forgive and you have not forgiven. Mm -hmm. At that time, I really was having resentment because I felt embarrassed. I felt betrayed. I felt belittled all of the above. And then, but the thing that caught my attention that I have to do something about the situation is that I was hurting me. How I know that? When I look in the mirror, I did not like what I was seeing. And I realized that I was harboring the resentment and it was tearing away at me. I didn't like my face. I started getting bags. My hair was breaking. And I'm saying, you know what? I am only hurting me. By that time, of course, my blood pressure was escalating. But the main mm -hmm. thing that caught my attention that I have to do something is that one of my sons, I wouldn't say which one, because I believe he's doing or he's listening. One of my sons said to me, Mommy, you're going to church every Sunday night and you're going to church every Wednesday night. Well, you're not talking to daddy, so you're not going to heaven. And here it is that I am there trying to live like a Christian, going to church every Wednesday night and Sunday night, harboring resentment, not talking to my spouse, and my son, whom I think was not um, a senior or, um, what should I say, seasoned Christian, telling me an older person, I am not going to heaven because I'm not talking to his dad. And so I had to step back, think about that, and find a solution to the problem. And so I had to make the first move. So, so Sister Bell, you, you, you were able to eventually relate. Uh, you were able to eventually relate to your spouse. And that's, that's the bottom line of what you're that's saying. That's the bottom here. line. And I was the one who made that first move. Okay, all right. Uh, so it, 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 it was a challenge for you, but you eventually got there. Yes, because it was affecting me physically too. So I had to make a move. Okay, wonderful. Let me ask, let me ask Sister Cora. Sister Gallery, um, have you been able to relate to your spouse and was it a challenge if so? Um, it, it is not a problem for me to relate um, to him but um, certainly um, for, for him, he doesn't really want to communicate. If we have to, we do, but I do not form any resentment or any unforgiveness or wish him any ill. So there is no issue. And I, I, I try to see it from you know, his side of the coin. And as at, at this present moment in time, he still feels okay. Um, as you were saying about, you know, the um, rejected that, you know, that I have wronged him. And so he is hurting. So um, there, I guess the difficulty which would come about is where if I want to communicate, but he doesn't. And so one just has to give him his space and, and let him do what must so that he could get through this process. Okay, very well. So, so let me just ask you another question. Um, as, as it relates to, I mean, care of the children, and that kind of thing, is it a challenge with the communication process there? It certainly is a challenge, and I believe that is where 
Um, the challenge comes about, um, but certainly he does communicate with the children and they're able to communicate with him. And I do not seek to uh, foster any dislike or say anything bad. So whatever is happening between myself and him, that is between us, and I seek not to get that to overspill onto the children. Okay, wonderful. Let me bring in um, um, Brother Adrian at this particular point. Um, Elder, same question to you. Um, we're civil. We, we, we speak if we have to speak. And um, I don't, I hope I don't hold any bad blood. And I hope that she doesn't either. Um, but to be honest, it's very difficult to reconcile this person who had uh, basically your heart and another person and the same person who no longer wants to have your heart. Um, and so for me, it was a challenge to reconcile that and uh, have much more than a civil relationship with um but we are we are we are civil um yeah we don't share intimate details we don't call up each other just to see how each other is doing unfortunately um i can't say that one day we won't get to that place but at present we are not okay very well thank you for being honest and open mm -hmm. and, and sharing there um, I, I want to go to a question uh, that was posed in the chat. And um, this, this question um, is, is an interesting one. If you were to remarry, um, what will you do differently? If you were to remarry, what no, I, I didn't ask you if you would remarry. I'll, I'll eventually ask that. But the question is, if you were to remarry, what would you do differently? In other words, I, I suppose um, the person who asked this question is wondering, um, did you contribute anything to this breakup? Or um, do you think you could have done something to, to, to prevent it? Um, well, mm -hmm. let me not put words in. Well, let me, let me, I'll probably start here. Um, okay. I generally think that both persons can always look back and see that there are things that they could have done differently. Even when there are cases of abuse or there are cases of infidelity, um, ultimately a relationship is based on two persons. And so I do think that I could have done things differently. I think um, communication, and uh, spending time um, with your spouse, I think those are very important. And not just being in each other's presence, but I think um, more meaningful and intentional about what you're doing while you're in each other's presence to build a relationship, um, build levels of communication, um, build trust, um, even though, and these are things that we assume are there before we get married, but as some of the things that I've read um, over the years have shown is that it's after you actually say the I do's that the real relationship starts and it, it takes some time for you to learn how to be one with another person. And so I definitely think communication and quality time, real quality time um, should be very important if I decide to get married again. Um, Pastor Adams, let me ask you to comment on this. It's a very, a very insightful comment that Elder Bass has, has just shared there. Um, let, let me ask you to, to, to comment on, on what he just said. You know, um, he, he indicated, for example, that from his perspective, it, it is after the marriage that the relationship um, really starts. Um, your, your comments, please. Interesting. He is so correct. Um, theologically correct. Um, and that concords with one of the very critical statements 
in the spirit of prophecy because the real work of marriage is really the work of the after years. That is what he's actually saying. It's really the work of the after years. And the era that he has mentioned um, there, I think I was alluding to that when I um, made the presentation during the family week, even though my direct um, presentation was not communication, I think I was relating to, I think I was talking to the issue of conflict and resolving issues. Um, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, um, and I, I like that study done by um, John Gottman, says that um, patterns of communication is a key factor and um, if there are issues there, um, particularly at the emotional level, the marriage begins to drift. And um, so people just don't separate like that. Um, the marriage begins to drift um, emotionally, and then um, it makes it easier for the physical separation, then legal and then communal, the four stages to a separation or divorce. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty um, critical, critical area. Um, I spend a lot of time um, in the premarital council room talking to that particular area you know, because um, it's the, he, he alluded to the fact of intimacy and intimacy grows and um, that's one of the major functions <laughs> of the communication and that first stage of marriage zero to three if the patterns are set and if the patterns are not set um, correctly where you are able to make these personal deep self-disclosure where you really have um, no fear, um, you're, 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 you're a real soulmate and you can really communicate at that level, you are well on your way. Um, if that pattern is not set in that first stage there, it could be very difficult um, going up further in the marriage because there are other challenges that will come at you. And if the pattern of not talking at that level um, has not been set, um, then it can be very challenging um, going up the road. So yes, um, that matter is very, very crucial. Um, you know, the levels of communication that we go at. Intimacy, intimacy grows and thrive on the level of communication, not just chit chat, ordinary talk, but where you are willing to make yourself open and plain and vulnerable um, because you are in a relationship with someone you love who will not hurt you. Um, at least we hope so. <laughs> um, so you can run the risk of making yourself vulnerable and talk to that at, at that level. And, and that's um, what I found in my work as well when I'm dealing with troubled marriages. Um, people have real issues um, with communication at that level where they are willing to talk to feelings and emotions. And there's where the rubber hits the road when it comes to communication between a husband and a wife. And, and of course, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are dealing with divorce as, as a topic for this afternoon. But the intent also is that individuals who are, are still married need to, to, to learn principles so that their marriages can be strengthened and, and the, the, the chances of survival can increase. And so that's a very important concept there. This matter of, of, of you know, I, you, you, you mentioned the study by Gottman with the four horsemen. What I want to say at this time, you know, and, and of course, for those persons who, who, who may not be familiar with that study, um, we're talking about um, four critical areas that, that, that really are an indication that your marriage is on a downward spiral. So when we talk about things like, like, like um, contempt, uh, <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. You know, the, 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 the whole issue is, and, and I suppose maybe a little later on we can come back to this, but the idea is you, you want to, to put your marriage in a, in a place where the, the effective um, discourse between husband and wife is one that is, 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 is healing one you know, if, if there is not that sense of goodwill, that sense of, of sharing and openness and, and free communication, um, if you are not in a place where you feel good about your spouse, I'm trying to use terms that everybody can follow, where you feel good about your spouse, where you enjoy each other's presence, you know, that's what you want. You want to be able to build a relationship that. That, that gives you a sense of belonging. Uh, when, when those critical elements are absent, then the relationship goes down on a, on a, on a, on a downward spiral. We, we, you, know, you know that I, I host a, a program on Second Advent um, 
called marriage encounter. And one of the things we mentioned there is that if you do no bad thing in your marriage, you know, you, you, you don't beat your spouse, you, you don't go out and treat, etc. But you don't do the nice little things to keep the relationship sweet. The relationship will tend naturally to go on a downward spiral. So, so we are saying here that marriage is, is, is um, like tending a garden. You have to constantly pull the weeds. You have to water the plants. You have to show love and demonstrate that atmosphere of togetherness um, for the relationship to, to, to prosper. And actually, Dr. Green, um, the point is germane. We're not really straying from the topic. It's germane because you're really talking to divorce proofing the marriage. Um, these things help to divorce proof the marriage. So mm -hmm. if these things are not being involved with it, you're, you're on the, the marriage is on its way to the cemetery, it's just a matter of time. Okay, very well. Well, um, who, who do I bring in here now? Sister Bell, um, let, let's go back to the question that I just asked earlier. Um, Brother Bass responded, and um, I, I want you to respond. What, what was that question now? Um, uh, what would I do different? Yes. Um, for me, I would talk less. I would argue less. But I would also not demand, but um, require from my spouse more quality time. Because instead of asking for quality time or ensuring that there's quality time, I would argue, why is it you're coming so late? Why is this and why is that? So I would talk less and the communication would be, would be more across the board rather than dictating or demanding. Now, now, Sister Bell, I'm going to ask you to, to, to um, say a little bit more on that. You are speaking to an issue that is very important in a marriage relationship, and you, you seem to be suggesting that as a spouse, perhaps you, you, you did argue too much, perhaps you did, you did um, go about things the wrong way, and, and I hear you saying you would talk less and you would argue less. Um, I, I just want you to, to highlight that a little bit for the yes, benefit of married person. Because um, my spouse at the time used to work some nights at the airport. And so I am there with the children, all three of them, trying to get them to finish the homework, trying to get them in bed by eight o'clock. I had no domestic helper. And so I am doing all of this and I'm still doing the domestic work. It therefore means that at the end of the evening, between eight and nine o'clock, I am out of it, extremely tired. And so I am not in the mood to be doing anything else or talking. So I am saying that here it is now that my spouse is coming in at that time. I am tired, and when I catch myself and he's there, I say, but wait, you just come, you got the time. You know, and so that is very, very critical that we have to be careful with what we say and how we say it. And the communication has to be across the board, both ways. And so we have to be careful as females to, to, to do away with the nagging and do more talking. And spending more quality time is of very, very critical importance. Because most of the critical time that we spend, or the quality time that we spend, is during the vacation period. Okay, so we are again dealing with this matter of communication. But well, let yes. me move on to Sister Gallery. Sister Gallery, um, how do you respond to that question? Um, if you were to marry again, what would you do differently? I'll say first and foremost, um, it would have to be someone that they have a relationship with God, that God is first place in their life. It's not just about speaking, but that it is present so that our moral and ethical values uh, are similar. And certainly that we will complement each other. So it would be choosing wisely, prayerfully, 
And if there are any red flags, not dismiss them, but certainly note the red flags for what they are. And if it is a matter of, okay, this is something that going forward, if it is here now, if we were to marry, it would become a problem. Then don't ignore it or feel that during the marriage they will get better or we will we will pray through through this and and get it right and most importantly get to know each other not rush into the marriage because it is despite being a divorcee i still see marriage as a lifetime commitment and something that is very important so it is necessary to lay the groundwork if you like um touching the whole unequally yoked that we must both be equally you. Those are very, very important things for me. Pastor Adams, I want to bring you in here. Sister Gallery mentioned the matter of values. You know, um, again, I, 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 I say on Marriage Encounter um, that the, the, the matter, some people think of compatibility as, as areas of, 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 um, commonality with respect to education and, and, and race and that kind of stuff. But the, 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 the matter of values is, is really where compatibility um, begins. Uh, when people have different values, when your value systems are different, it, it just is, is a bad recipe for, for, for a good marriage. Can you comment on that? Yes, yeah, definitely, because values are seriously affect your attitude and your behavior. So values affect your attitude and your behavior. And um, as it, it is so crucial, because um, when we talk the value, we are talking about moral value, religious, spiritual values, and not just for the couple itself, but for, for posterity. If you have children in that union, whose values will they take and go with? Um, um, you're talking about not extrinsic, you're talking about real intrinsic values that are, and, and those things should really be spiritually um, um, div what the right what I'm sorry for those, those things should be really um, the, the the spiritual they, they should be based on this that's where we get our axiology from our values from they should be spiritual they should be spiritually um, defined if I, if I were that's the word I want to say what for a better term and so that's that's a very very critical area and and that is why we have to spend um, some uh, some critical time. Um, discussing um, inclusion issues and inclusion issues means um, looking carefully at the values. Um, do I really want to be in this relationship with this person when we have these dissimilar values, um, real core dissimilar values, you know, um, and sometimes we don't want to ask those hard question when we are dealing with what we call the stage of the relationship where we're dealing with inclusion issues where we are looking at these things um, very very critically um, because like I said it is at the marriage hour and Mrs. White says that this is the marriage hour that we quote either our happiness or unhappiness by the choice we make when we disregard paying attention to these things and they can end up up the road having us in the situation where the separation and divorce um, has to come about. Um, I, I, I don't know if you're going to ask another question, but I wanted to go back to something that Sister Bell was saying, um, because I, I, while the thought is with me, I don't want us to lose it, um, because, you know, um, I'm sure. still looking at the time, if you're going to finish with the half an hour extra. Um, she, she mentioned something about um, what her son told her because she was having this anger and this bitterness. Um, that's one of the things that you have to work through. Um, um, and I have that talk into the recovery itself because um, those things can hold you back from, from rediscovering yourself and what potential you have to rebuild um, yourself first and not even thinking about relationship yet, right? Uh, in fact, I would say to people, those who have not been married, go slow. And if you've been married and separated and thinking remarried, I would say go, go even slower. We said one year of healing for every year of marriage, <laughs> right? Um, because that is a wounded injured person and you have to be very sure that you are healed and get closure and have gotten closure and you're in a state of equilibrium where you can invest emotionally again in another relationship so i was making the point that working through bitterness and, and learn to forgive and anger and bitterness and and the disappointment all of that um, they can remain longer after the ink dries up 
But you see, bitterness and anger can shape your personality, and that is not what you want. So that you face your new life with this hardened, um, possibly negative attitude, um, and that can cause um, friction with relationship with other people and cause rejection. Um, part of the rejection that you face um, can be linked to the bitterness um, and the vengeful, unforgiving spirit that you carry. Um, and this can take uh, an effect and help. The bitterness and an unforgiven spirit is bad for your health and your relationship with others and many. Okay, Pastor Adams, I, I want to jump in here. Um, the two things I want to say quickly. We are speaking to, to divorce, but we are also talking to married people and we are talking also to single persons who are not yet married. And, and just to go back on the issue of values, this, this especially becomes important to those who are not yet married. My experience with, 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 with couples um, preparing for marriage is that there is this tendency not to be very careful with looking at the matter of values. And they always tend to think that their circumstances will be different from others. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize that. But I want you to, you mentioned just now, Pastor, this matter of, of um, one year of marriage for one year of healing. You know, um, I don't know how best to say to persons who are coming out of a relationship that they need to give time to heal properly and to be themselves and to be comfortable with themselves before they consider the matter of getting into another relationship. One of the reasons why second marriages have a higher rate of failure than first marriages is because people are not properly healed. Right. And there is this rebound element where people, yes. you know, because of the lack or somebody still wounded, along, still wounded, still injured, but yet going to another relationship. Correct. That, is, that is disastrous. So, so that, that element is, is extremely important. And I, I trust that those who are, um, in situations of failed relationships will give um, serious attention to this dimension. All right, now let's go with another question to um, the, the, the panelists, those of you who have been through this, this, this um, challenge of divorce. I wanna ask you now, how difficult has it been um, living as a single person after having been married for as long as you were, um, what do you miss most about married life? Um, who wants to begin with this one? Let me start, Pastor, to save time. Okay. Um, yeah, basically, four. Um, I would say I miss the, the nice family worship that we had in the mornings and going through the Sabbath school lesson, you know, and especially with the children hearing their little explanations of what they think the lesson is say. I really miss that. And most importantly, that I, that I really enjoyed was the meal time when everybody come together to eat, you know. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a moment of explosion. I have to listen, and my spouse at the time had to listen to everything that happened at school that day, from the time the bell went until at the end of school. And, of course, the romantic moments um, that we enjoyed and the vacation time, because um, during the marriage, we used to travel on eBay tickets, and so it was not that expensive for us. We used to travel and debate. And after that, the travel was limited. And so those are the four main areas that I miss in the marriage. Okay. Um, now, you mentioned there the, the matter of the meal times. You, you make it sound like it was really exciting. Um, the children reporting their activities for the day mm -hmm. and 
you know, and that kind of thing. It sounds Everybody pretty interesting. And I'm talking, yes. Yes. Um, so I did also ask, um, well, of course, the difficulty, the first part of the question, how difficult has it been living as a single person after being married for so many years? The difficulties is, is great, Pastor, and it continues. Um, if I might say, one of the difficulties was financial. Mm -hmm. Because at the time when the marriage was demised, both of us were still into the bank. Here it is now that the marriage is annulled, and um, we still owe the bank for the house in which we were living. I was still owing the bank for the car that I drove. And so the, the financial aspect of it was extremely difficult. And when I spoke to my pastor about it, he said, well, that is a situation that he's not able to advise in. What he could suggest to me is that I seek legal counsel, which I did. And so the most difficult part of that separation and divorce is financial and still is financial. Okay, challenge. Um, Sister Gallery, would you want to come in here um, and respond to that question? Um, what, what do you miss most about married life and, um, and um, how difficult has it been um, living as a single person after having been married? Well, um, as it relates to what I miss, I've been racking my brains to see what I <laughs> could uh, come up with. But um, certainly um, it is more of the family unit of having um, that father figure in the, the, the family. Um, and um, certainly the most difficult part living as a single person was initially in the beginning, and I guess it's going back to um, what um, Pastor Adams was saying, was in terms of, I didn't know at the time, but that I was in a vulnerable position. And so um, for me, it was wanting to ensure that if you like, I have this family unit, you know, for the children that, you know, that a father figure is present and also vulnerable in the sense that, you know, in this relationship for all these years and you, 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 there was someone there regardless of um, how it was going or not. And then here I was that I am now getting this attention that I wasn't getting uh, before. And so it sort of caused me to get myself in vulnerable position in the, in the sense that you make a mistake that you should not have made. So for me, that was the most difficult thing because here you are saying, okay, you are a Christian, not necessarily being self-righteous, but you do not expect to do certain things. So number one, you have already um, felt guilty about having a divorce. And then now you then go and get yourself in a position where you make a mistake that you would never expect to have um, to have made. And so that for me um, was the most difficult thing to happen to me. But certainly I did not. It was also a wake up call because as I would have mentioned on the last occasion that after um, I, I left, it, it was difficult for me to go to church. I was going to church, but to feel that, you know, feel okay that I hadn't disappointed myself or God. And it took me about every time it was communion pastor, I would have an excuse not to be at church. And I remember it was Pastor Sherman White. I don't know if he picked up on it. And then he would be like, I didn't see you at church today, sister. And so when I made that mistake, for me, it was like, no, Corey, this is not the life that you want. So for others that they may have continued, for me, it was a wake up call. And I realized, OK, I have fallen away from God where I am supposed to be. And so for me, that was a, a turn in life, a turning point. And um, just going back to God and going forward. And so it is not difficult now because I decided to, to get spiritually sound, if you like, to, to get spiritually battened up and battled up. And that, for me, um, helps me through. Thank you so much. 
Um, what about us? Hey, Pastor. Same question? Uh, same question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, living as a single person after divorce has been an interesting challenge. And um, some of the areas that are most challenging is um, developing other relationships and being able to um, control the level of intimacy because moving from a place where you are married and so you should be enjoying the fullness of intimacy that God desires for man and woman and then moving to a place where you are now dating and um, the things that you used to do, you should not be doing them anymore, then it becomes a challenge. Actually, for me, that was, apart from other reasons, that was one of the reasons why for a long time I did not date. Because um, from early after the breakup, um, I realized that that would be a challenge. So I prayed a lot for God's strength. Um, not to get involved and I, I build a hedge of protection and um, because you didn't necessarily want to dishonor God. Um, and sometimes it felt as though the, the flesh was stronger than the spirit. Um, so that was one of the major challenges of living a single life. Um, and what did I miss most about married life? I think I just missed everything about married life because marriage to me is one of the most beautiful creations that we have received from God, um, one of the best institutions, so only second to the Sabbath. And so um, I think marriage brings out our best potential of growth and who we can be in God. And so I really missed marriage, missed having that person that you love by your side and um just living each day with that person, the, the, the good and the bad, the joys and the pains, but just marriage in, in general. Um, and I mentioned before that one of the most difficult parts of it was um, the loneliness that exists. Um, and I think that just comes from the entire package being taken away from you. And so that's one of the most yeah, yeah, that's that's just one of the most difficult things to deal with about not being married anymore. The missing of the entire package that is called marriage. And that includes the quote unquote bad times. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, thank you, Elder. <laughs> now now um we we have spoken a lot about you sharing your experiences and um we want to look at coping mechanisms. We we we, we, we want to speak to the whole matter of healing after the divorce. You know, you have been through the breakup. Nobody would necessarily plan for or, or choose that way, but the eventualities of life sometimes lead down that road. So let's talk about coping. Let's talk about getting to that point where you are uh, 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 happy with yourself, where you are satisfied with being single. Um, the journey towards there, Pastor Adams, let's bring you in here. The journey towards wholeness and healing um, for, for individuals who have been through this divorce. And, 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 and this is a real issue. In fact, I, I, I got a WhatsApp from someone who has been, um, you know, through, through the journey of, of, of a separation and um, the, the whole point is coping. How do I, as an individual who was there, cope? What kind of coping skills? Well, maybe before I bring you in, Pastor Adams, let's ask the the individuals. Um, Brother Bass already shared that one of the things he did earlier on was to decide not to date, at least uh, earlier on. But I just want each of you to share very quickly before I go to Pastor mm -hmm. Adams. Um, what, what are some of the coping mechanisms that you employed? Um, how did you um, survive during that particular period of time? Um, Sister Galvin, can we begin? Um, okay, Sister Bell. As I said, when we, we met on the February 20th, that the very next year after divorce was CXC for my daughter. And um, I remember one day I came home and I was trying to take my clothes off and I found that this left hand would not go up. 
And I called her. She was at the table doing some homework. And I called her and I said, I said, Shapes, come here. Come and help me take out this blouse because my hand wouldn't go up. She came and she said, what happened to this hand? I said, I don't know. It's just not going up. And then she struggled with me. She said, you know, mommy, how can I take care of you? It looks like you're getting sick, you know. How can I take care of you when I have to study for exams? And that triggered some thoughts in my head. And to make a long story short, I decided I was going to pray about this. I'm going to pray and pray and pray and fast. And in praying, I got three remedies. One is to change my diet. So I did that. I changed my diet. I started eating less meat, increased my exercise program, and start looking personally at myself. I spoke with a, a nurse friend of mine, and I told her what was happening to my hand. And she said, you need to go to the doctor because you seem as if you're getting a stroke. I said, stroke? What do you mean by stroke? She said, yes, you seem to be getting a stroke. So I went to the doctor and he said, you know what? There's something going on inside here and it is affecting this muscle across here. And in order to get rid of it, you're going to, I'm going to have to go into your shoulder. I said, okay, when I get home, I'll think about it and we'll talk. And so one of the coping skills is that I decided there and then that I was going to stop worrying about other people and think about myself. So I did what I said. I changed my diet. I started exercising more. I started looking after myself. And I called one of my pastor's wives. Right? So that's Sister Arlene James. And she told me, you know what? When you're going to exercise, what time you're going to exercise? Say five o'clock. She said, I'm going to meet you at yes, about five o'clock. And we met there. And for two weeks, we decided that we were going to pray and fast about the shoulder. And that's what we did. And pastor, believe it or not, I never had surgery on this hand um, after that. The hand came back normal because I decided I wasn't going to worry about anything because the worry is taking the blood pressure to a level where it's affecting me physically. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I am going to now do more exercise and take care of myself. I was using the New Start program. And the second point is I want to be present when my daughter was graduated. I want to be able to hear with my own ears, Dr. Siobhan Denry Maria Bell. I want to be able to hear it. And I'm saying to myself, if I want to be able to hear it, I have to change my whole attitude, my whole lifestyle, my whole worry in aspect, and think about, one, my job that was very critical at the time because I needed the money, two, my daughter's graduation and the boy's graduation as well, and three, about my own health. And so I started thinking more about me and started doing the things that will help me to live longer and enjoy a better life. Very insightful, very useful. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sister Bell. Let's go to Sister Gallery now. Um, coming out of the relationship, I had a very low self-esteem. And after realizing that I was still susceptible to make mistakes, I decided to surround myself with persons that I could confide in and persons who would not um, judge me. And in the process to build up myself and to realize that I didn't need someone in order for me to be whole, that me in and of myself, that I am whole. And so it was a process of, you know, building confidence. And, and as Sister Bell was saying about praying and, you know, focusing more on ministry because then that gave me a purpose of not wanting to have someone or be in a relationship, but knowing that I was enough and that God would get me through. Certainly, um, Brother Bass said about not dating, um, Yes, I continue to date, but now I knew, okay, well, you have to make sure that you put these boundaries in place, because if you do not put these boundaries in place, that this is what it's going to lead to, that is going to lead to intimacy, which is what you do not want, having, you know, made that mistake. It is not a, a ground or, or somewhere that you want to travel again, because 
you and part of it that helps me cope is where I see that I want to be an example for others. And so that helps me as well in that it gives me a sense of accountability that you'll be able to minister to somebody to say, well, look, it is possible. I have been able to do it. And so you can do it. And so that is that is how I cope. And um, I'm, I'm not fully there but I am getting there, um, having that confidence and surrounding myself with, um, with, with persons who encourage me along the way. And, and I know that one of the other ways is like speaking to my, um, my pastors. And I know that for me, the first time that I was able to see myself positively as someone, um, as, a, as a divorcee is when I went to um, Pastor Sherwin White, who was my pastor at the time. And, and certainly he, he was able to encourage me and he was able to give me tools um, with which to, to cope. And, and one of the things that, and, and I would encourage others that sometimes I remember Pastor White called me in and, he was like, um, Sister Galloway, I'm hearing your name associated with, with, with someone and I'm not liking what I'm hearing. And I remember, you know, thinking, what is Pastor, I'm a big woman. <laughs> what is Pastor White calling me in to, to ask me about? I didn't say that to him, but what it demonstrated is that, you know, he was concerned and, and I'm forever thankful because, you know, he went through a process. We, we had a talk and for the fact that he had time to, to sit down and, and talk with me and, and give me tools which I could cope. That was something that I certainly, at the time, I didn't like the fact that he had called me in, but after, you know, being at the meeting and after, you know, you talking about it, I realized that what he did was in a good place and that he um, certainly set me up with good stead. Thank you very much. Very insightful again. Um, Brother Bell, Brother Bass, Bass. sorry. <laughs> let's, let's go to you on this question now. Um, okay, so similar to the other two panelists, um, we, we we uh, did uh, quite a few similar things like staying active. Okay, it seems as if we have a little um, bad connection with, with Elder Bass. So I'm going to come back to him in a minute. Um, just, just allow a little time for his internet to stabilize and then we will go back to him now you both have um i remember i was playing okay, bass um, on like two and three times per week for a big part of my school time brother bass um let me interrupt you there a minute there is a little um connectivity problem with your internet so uh, just just permit me to um allow a little time to, to pass by so that you can stabilize, if you don't mind. Um, okay, let's try again. We okay. missed most of what you said, but let's try again. Go right ahead. So you're going to have to start over. Okay, okay so I, I was saying that um, similarly to the other panelists, and I immersed, immersed myself in work. Um, I became more active um, where basketball was concerned, I was a lot more basketball. Um, like if I may say so. Dr. Green? Yes. You hearing me now? Yes, I'm hearing you now. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I was saying that I became more active. Um, I was playing a lot more sports and um, became more active at work and even immerse myself more in ministry. But the thing is that I don't want us to miss is, not, is that not everybody has the ability to adjust in this way or deal with the difficulties that they're going through in this way. And sometimes you need to break down and cry. Sometimes you need to have someone that you sit and you speak with and somebody that checks on you regularly. Sometimes we don't open up and we try to deal with the pain or the difficulty by ourselves. And that ends up in a spiral, a downward spiral. We end up 
um, in depression. That's why you find people who want to turn to things like suicide to deal with the pain. Um, they become addicted to substances and to practices that they really should not be involved in. And so um, I had friends that even though I was seen as a strong person, I had persons who I could talk to. And it's not all the time that we spoke about the difficulty of the pain, but it's just people that you could talk to. So God sent me some friends um, right around that time. Um, I remember I gained a, a new friend from St. Kitts during that time, and we had a very active online friendship. Um, and I had persons in Antigua who always checked up on me, always called me. Um, just to see how I was doing and to ensure that I'm good. So sometimes, yes, some of us are able to deal with the pain, find coping mechanisms, but sometimes we need others to help us to learn how to cope or help or help carry us through the period of difficulty. And for some of us as well, the period of difficulty is very long. I heard Pastor Adam speak about a year for each year of marriage. And sometimes I think some of us need to double up and take two years for each year of marriage as well um, because of how, how, how much devastation you go through, especially mentally, um, by losing a spouse. Uh, thank you very much, Brother Bass. Thank you for sharing so candidly. Now, Pastor Adams, um, each of these persons highlighted a few common areas. They, they all spoke to the matter of having caring persons around. Yes, them. very, very necessary. They all spoke to the matter of beginning to concentrate on lifting their self-esteem, loving themselves yeah. and taking mm -hmm. care of themselves. These, yes. are, these are very important areas right. to, to, um, to help your coping mechanism, to strengthen you and to give you the, the, the resilience that, that is necessary to get back to that point mm -hmm. where you can you know, be comfortable with who you are as an individual. But you may want to add a few things to that, Pastor. Right, for sure. And let me go back to the top, right? Part of the process is allowing yourself to grieve. And those of us who are in ministry and fellow church members and so, allow the person who's been through this experience to grieve. In fact, um, it usually takes between two to 10 years to start to feel like it's normal again, at least between two to 10 years to start to feel normal again. Because you see, we are saying that divorce is really a death in the civilization and um, the grieving is part of the healing, right? The grieving is part of the healing because the most um, four devastating words you can hear is that I want a divorce. Mm -hmm. um, to hear, um, I do turn to, I don't want you um, anymore is not, is not easy. So um, people must be allowed to let go bit by bit because the fragmentation and the vacuum um, that is left after this separation, this breakup, this betrayal, whatever has happened here is not easy. I'm repeating that it is not easy. Help people to grieve, right? Um, that is what they want. And sometimes when we do grief work, you just need to just be a listening ear, a, a shoulder to, to, you don't even need to say anything, just a shoulder to lean on, a shoulder to cry on, a couch to sleep on or something. Um, just allow people to grieve. And like I'm saying that there's no straight line by which people go to these stages. You can cross over denial and stay at anger and sometimes get parked there. You can get to depression. Um, there's no straight line when my brother was separated, he he was parked in a place of real anger. I said, real anger. You know, um, this is what he related to me and this is what I saw, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But you know, um, you cannot deal with your own family members so you can just give a general, but you have to give because it, it is recommended that you don't deal with your, your family members clinically. Allow somebody else to do that. You can just give general advice and um, <laughs> whatever. But um, let people grieve, first thing. And um, I heard all the panelists spoke about having friends. Um, that is so crucial. Um, um, rely on close friends who may help to prevent you from doing things that you may later live to regret. Um, you know, and that is so, um, I mean, friends who you can trust, right? 
and, and, and they've all mentioned that not just friends, but friends who you can trust. In fact, you need to make some new circle of friends because some of those friends that you would have had would have let go since you bec um, become a divorcee. And um, mm -hmm. some of these new friends uh, will not have you rehash the painful memories of the past. You have, you, you have a new social network. And, and that is so crucial. Develop some new friends. Not, uh, Pastor um, Adams, I, I want to button here because yes, um, sometimes one of the added pain of a divorce, a separation, a breakdown of a marital relationship is because in the marriage, the couple fortunately, well, not fortunately, certainly, unfortunately, did not allow themselves to get genuine friends. It is, right. it is a, a big deal that some relationships are dysfunctional. And I've, I've, I've come across situations where a woman, for example, is forbidden to have close friends from her husband. It, having genuine friends, be it just a few, but genuine friends, individuals who love you for who you are and will be able yes. to stand with you through thick and thin, will really come to your aid in times like this. Yes. So that that I just wanted to mention that because that's true. Again, we're dealing very with very true. Just as how <laughs> just as how no man is an island, no family is an island. You have you should have some close friends, very trusted close friends, because all of us do have our struggles and our troubles at some time or the other, and you need close genuine friends. That is so important. In fact, I worry when people say they don't have any close friends. <laughs> you don't have any close genuine friends. That is not a good space to be in. That is not a compliment at all. You know, you should have at least some very close friends who you can turn to. And then is when you know um, your real genuine friends, when you really are going through troubles and struggles, those who stay with you um, and help you through, those are your real genuine friends. Right. So, so yes, um, they, they've said that. So you should have some close friends. And so then we say um, you should um, don't let um, divorce become your identity. Don't let the divorce or the separation become your identity because people can push you to that um, point. Yes, loss of status can be humiliating and several things like that. But um, what has actually happened, um, You the divorce or the separation is an experience, it's not your identity. You have been through an experience of separation and divorce, but don't allow that to define you or become your identity, right? Because um, remember, life goes on after that and you have to do building back. And I did hear Cora say about um, the self-esteem issues that she was feeling and all of that. Those are real things, right? Because um, it is really a betrayal at the soul level and, and what that partner has actually done is to strip you of all of that and to make you feel that, well, um, you, you aren't worth it. And that's why I'm dumping you or I'm outing this relationship um, from you, right? Um, so yes, real feelings of self-worth and all of those and come into play. But because I'm a Christian counselor, I want to say that the person or the place that gives us our worth and value is the cross, right? Um, um, we can know for sure that regardless of what experience we have been through, um, look at the man on the cross. He died for you, whatever he did there was for you. And therefore he gives you the value. And, and Cora said something so very crucial, very, very crucial. Don't want us to miss that point. She said that she came to the point where it was okay to be alone and feel adequate. If you don't come to that place, you are not ready for any new relationship. You're not ready for remarriage, right? Um, you have to come to the place where you feel adequate by yourself and love yourself who, who you really are, right? Because in essence, what marriage is, um, loving the other person, that relationship is the degree that I love myself, you see? And both persons must have that commitment to be given. And you can't give from a position of emptiness, right? Um, that both person must be given. And, and so um, but to, to talk about remarriage is another um, thing. You can have friends. Um, you can even date. I heard um, the boss says um, he, he, he postponed dating. Um, there, are there are different types of dating, right? Um, you can go to the group. Do not become a social isolate because depression and loneliness and all this. So you can date, right? Even so if you go out 
you know, uh, you're a married person, uh, you're a single um, male woman, you have some good close friends go on a, a date. Um, you have girlfriends go on a date, hang out. I'm talking about your close friends who um, are with you and um, through the, that's part of the process. And if you're gonna, um, you should have friends um, that you can that you can trust, right? But keep it light. Um, it's, it's just to have fun. You're not looking for a soulmate. Um, just someone that is pleasant to talk things over 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 dinner or over watching a movie. Um, that kind of thing. I'm not talking about any type of romantic um, relationship now. But you should have friends, right? You should have friends and even go on a date. It's okay um, to go on a date, right? And um, to to not um, make yourself a social isolate. Um, part of the coping, rebuilding, I, you should seek professional support, right? So friends may be available to you. You, they, you can talk to them, their shoulder to lean on, their couch to sleep on. But for to jumpstart your new life, um, you probably need to talk to a, te a therapist. And I heard Cora said, yes, um, she spoke to Pastor White. Um, that's a spiritual advisor because that, that's a pastor um, or a bishop. Um, because divorce is a process and having a professional outline or treatment plan um, that is fit for you can be very useful, right? Because there are many issues that you have to deal with, not just the actual separation, but again, dealing with your own pain. If you have children and depending who is the custodial person, um, time, energy, um, your whole schedule is um, upside down. Um, then the economic situation, because I did hear the panelists mention that um, these are the realities and men, women um, are affected um, a little bit more when you look at the stun studies in terms of gender, in terms of economics after. Um, there they, they are core areas um, or core domain that we have to look at. Um, what is the economic um, survival of the person? What about the social and uh, the domestic life um, after that? What about the health and physical well-being? Um, these are critical areas. Um, and, and a lot of studies have, have done, have been conducted in these areas, right? And, and they vary in terms of the genders. And so you would need, um, you might need a professional person. They also alluded to the, well, the fact um, there in the responses that you got from the panelists, um, you have to reinvent and reorganize yourself because we are no longer we now. Um, you're being one half of a couple for a while that you're accustomed to and then you're losing, uh, losing that role can make um, you question really who you are. So you have to list things about yourself um, that are separate from us, the former roles, um, husband or wife, and, and you have to look at the attributes that you have, the strength that you have, um, when are you at your best, um, what, what do you have, what, what do you value most about yourself. Um, this type of self-evaluation um, help you to start um, the next chapter in, in your new life. This is so very important. Um, you know, so I, I think I could mention those for the time being. And um, I have some words to talk to um, if you want me to go on or if you if you want me to stop and bring in. Um, well, open. Well, well, you know, we, we can never exhaust the areas um, when we deal with something like this. Um, there, there are lots of questions that people are asking. Um, some some persons, a few persons have been even thinking that maybe I'm not dealing with all the questions in the chat, so they, 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 they WhatsApp me personally. We can't cover everything possibly. <laughs> um, you know, I, I glanced at the chat just now, I realized that um, some folks are speaking to Brother Bass. Brother Bass, you have to look out because um, <laughs> I see some comments there. Um, but uh, Dr. Green, if I might say, the Lord, the Lord has... Um... Yes, Brother Bass. Um, I think you. Please. Yeah. Okay, Brother Bass was was about to comment, but he has some internet failure. I love to comment here, Pastor. Okay, uh, Brother Bass is back. So let's 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 go back to him. Brother Bass, unmute and um, and go ahead. Okay, so I was saying um, I've also seen some of the comments, and I'm humbled. Um. God has sent someone who has filled the long void, the void that has been there for so many years. And so um, we, we, we're not hard because or anything like that, but um, the, the vacancy has already been filled <laughs> so far. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
All right, so you're, you're putting that disclaimer there. All right. He's not available, yes, y'all. Yes, He's I not available, you. y'all. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> okay, Sister Bell, you wanted to make a comment. We yeah, have just want- about okay. five minutes. Yes, quite. I, I know so time is gone, but I wanted to say that I haven't heard any mention of, of pressures from in-laws. And that is also one of the, one of the negatives that affect marriages. I'll give you a quick example. I remember one day, one of my in-laws came over to visit as normal. We sat down, we were eating, we were drinking and so on. And then we were just chilling out as the young people say. And so while we were there, the in-laws said to me, wait, what happened to the table that was in, the center table that was in the living room? I said, it's not there anymore. I moved it and put it against the wall so that this, my son at the time was creeping and, you know, trying to walk. So he would have more space because, you know, when they're toddlers, they're very inquisitive. And there was a vase, as we say in Antigua, a vase with flowers on the table. And he kept gravitating towards it. She said, but no, it don't look so nice at the side of the wall. You know, why don't put it back in the center? I said, no, I don't want it in the center because it's going to get in the way of the child creeping. Do you know the in-law got up from where she was sitting? took up the table from the side of the wall and put it back in the center oh. of the living room. Well. <laughs> and I said, but wait, what is going on here? And so without thinking, I went, took up the table and put it back against the wall. And I'm telling the panelists and pastor and viewing audiences that was a big, big thing. Big, big thing. And it took weeks before the family could settle down. Remember, my spouse then was not in the living room. But apparently, that in-law complained to him that she moved the table and I removed it back. And that became a sore spot. And so I am saying this afternoon that marriage has a lot. Your own attitude and also the attitude of in-laws intruding in the marriage. And I'm saying, when I was thinking about it afterwards, it would have been better for me to leave the table in the center where she had put it until after she left and then put it back at the side where I wanted it. Okay, but a bass doesn't, but maybe, a bass doesn't agree with you at all. Maybe. I, can, I, no, can, I, I, I don't know if the attitude was, this is my table and this is my living room, so I put it where I want. I don't know if the attitude was bad, but I am saying on hindsight, it might have been better if I'd left the table where she had put it. And then after she would have left, I can put it back where I want it. Well, you know, guess what? We, we really don't wanna... have time to go into that debate right now. Um, I see Brother Bass really wants to comment. We have only two more minutes, so we're going to have to wrap up here. In laws. Um, Pastor Adams, we, we haven't spoken about remarriage at all, and maybe you and I will come back one day and just address issues dealing with remarriage after a divorce. Um, what we were focusing on is, is, is surviving and thriving and coping, and I mm-hmm. think we were able to address that quite clearly. Um, in the minute and a half that we have remaining, I want to ask each one of the panelists to give a, a summary statement. I'm going to ask you to please make it real short. Um, because we only have a minute and a half. So, Brother Bass, um, your final word. Okay, um, I just want to encourage persons who may be going through difficult times in their marriage to fight for their marriage, um, trust in God, and seek help as much as help is available to you. If you end up being divorced, all is not lost. Um, keep trusting in God and keep living for God. Personally, I had decided not to remarry, not to get involved with anybody else, but circumstances would have allowed based on the scriptures. But your your life is much more than just a marriage and divorce doesn't end it. What the devil meant for evil, God can turn it around and use it for your good. So may God bless us all as we seek to live for him day by day. Thank you so much. Sister Gallery. What I would say to those who are trying to survive after divorce is that, yes, you will make mistakes, but do not uh, beat on yourself. Um, Trusting God, yes, you are 
worthy, you are of value, you may feel down right now, you may feel that um, the best thing that happened to you, that you have lost it, but have faith, hold on to God, and just press forward, onward and upward, keep building yourself, support yourself with trusted people, and talk, don't hold it in, talk so that you could get help. Thank you. Sister Bell. Yes, um, I would just like to say that divorce is not the end of the world. And so even though a person has gone through or is going through divorce, you have to look after yourself, exercise, you know, be an example to children if you have children and other fam family members. Live one day at a time and remain calm, even though the storm is raging. And I just give this text, Isaiah 41 and verse 13, which says, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. And one last thing is that we have to remember that after our earthly sojourn, divorce is not going to be the end. There is heaven at last. And divorce has a spiritual component, an eternal consequences are also tied into divorce and we have to be careful how we treat each other while we are here on earth according to how we treat each other we will get the benefits and may god help us that we will continue to forgive and i wanted us to touch on that but we didn't get time forgiveness is the key when once yeah, that, we have started, that will be another topic right once we have start to forgive Life becomes easier and you start getting back your self-esteem. And so forgiveness is the key. After forgiveness has taken place, and it takes time, but after forgiveness has taken place, you're able to relate not only to the in-laws, but to the spouse, um, past spouse. Thank you so much, Sister Bell. Our time has expired. We want you to know that next week and Let's Talk, we are going to finish our discussion on, on infidelity um final segment of that and we are dealing with a fear proof in your marriage um that's next week on let's talk um a very important and insightful discussion coming on the heels of this um presentation it was a mm -hmm. pleasure having you we are completely out of time i want to wish you god's blessings and encourage you to be faithful and to move forward with the assurance that god is with you thank you all so much and god bless you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much for having me, Pastor.